Okay, here's OCR 2021 A Level Physics, Paper 1 Modeling Physics. And unlike AQA, I can show this paper on screen because OCR are chill. Here we go. Multiple choice first, which is my favorite. Object moving in a straight line, we have a displacement time graph. Where does it have the greatest speed? Well, positive speed is going to be A, isn't it? But we're just looking for the steepest gradient. It's going to be C. Two, which one of these represents the smallest multiplication factor? Of course, we should know that it's femto because that's times 10 to the minus 15, whereas micro is times 10 to the minus 6, nano times 10 to the minus 9, pico times 10 to the minus 12. So the answer is A. Three, some data for a car traveling straight road with an initial speed of 13 meters per second. So that's our U. Car has a constant deceleration when the brakes are applied. What is the magnitude of the deceleration of the car during braking? Okay, we're just going to be using some SUVAT then. So we know that U is 13. We know that V is zero because it comes to a standstill. We're looking for acceleration. We're not concerned with time, but we do have a distance, which is 14 meters. Why are we being given thinking distance? That's weird. So we're going to be using V squared equals U squared plus 2AS. We're not too concerned with minuses and pluses, so we can just say basically that u squared is equal to 2as. Yes, it's gonna be minus, but you know, it doesn't really matter. Therefore, getting rid of 2 and s to the other side, acceleration is equal to u squared, so that's 13 squared, divided by two loss of the distance, so that's two times 14, so that's 13 squared divided by 28, and that gives us pretty much bang on six meters per second squared. So the answer is C. Four freezing points of ethanol is 159K. Oh, cool. What is it in degree C? Well, we know that zero degree C is 273 Kelvin. Therefore, we know it's going to be less than zero degrees. So it can't be C and D. And it certainly can't be A either because that's lower than absolute zero. So without even doing any maths, we know the answer has to be B. Five, a spectral line corresponds to a wavelength lambda one and then it's observed as lambda two, okay, from the galaxy that is moving away. What is the correct expression for the Hubble constant H zero? Okay, so, so we know that the Hubble equation is V is equal to H, H zero, whatever, D. So rearranging this, we have H is equal to V over D. Okay, but now we need our Doppler shift malarkey so we can say that v over c is equal to change in lambda over lambda so of course we are going to have to have a change in lambda so it has to be one take away the other so it can't be c or d and then well we can see that we're going to have to have c on top don't we so therefore popping that all in there we end up with h is equal to change in lambda times c divided by lambda d so therefore it is going to be a for an SHM oscillator, maximum speed is A, ba 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 ba. What expression is correct for the oscillator? V max is equal to 2 pi FA. Yeah, we should know that, shouldn't we? Well, yeah, it's basically that. We know that V max is equal to omega A. I mean, the original equation is plus or minus omega root A squared minus X squared. But if we're talking about at amplitude, that disappears. And so this just turns into amplitude, doesn't it? So it's so the maximum speed is omega a so the answer is b seven planet mercury going around the sun elliptically here we have the force against distance what does the area under the graph between the distances x and y represent okay so we know that f is equal to g m m over r squared but if it's the area under the graph then that means that it's f times r so f times r gives us well, GMM over R. And so therefore, this is our equation for energy. I mean, we know that, don't we, from just work done. So work done is equal to FD or FR in this case. So area under the graph is essentially, when it comes to an equation, just those two variables multiplied together. So we know it's going to be something to do with energy. It's going to be a difference in energy. So let's have a look. Centripetal force, no, it can't be that. The change in gravitational potential energy of mercury, yes, absolutely. Impulse, no. Kinetic energy of mercury, no, because it's just a change in energy, isn't it? So the answer has to be B. Don't know how I managed to mess this up quite so magnificently the first time round, but here we go. 
So we have the weight pulling down, but I'll tell you what, I'm just going to split this whole question in two. So we know that, well, they're equal, don't we? So that's pulling up there with two newtons. This is 35 degrees here. This we can say is half the weight. Yes, we know that we have two lots of that, don't we? But we can just forget about the other half and then just double it right at the end, can't we? So let's just deal with half of it. So we want the vertical component that's pulling upwards because that's going to be equal to W over two then, isn't it? So therefore we can say that this is two cos 35. If you don't know where I'm getting that from, have a look at my easy vectors trick video. And I think we should end up with something like one, something like 1.75, but let's check two cos 35. 1.65, something like that. So that gives us actually 1.64 newtons. There we go. So if that's half the weight, then therefore the weight is going to be equal to two times 1.64. And that is roughly about 3.3 newtons. So the answer is D. Nine, piston has fixed the amount of trapped ideal gas. I know the feeling. Gas exerts a pressure P volume V, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, we know that. We don't need to be told this, dude. What quantities are required to determine the root mean square speed of the atoms? Okay, so we know that, well, first of all, well, I'll tell you what, let's have a look at our formula sheet, shall we? So we know that the equation with CRMS in is this. So PV is equal to a third NM c squared i'm just going to call it c squared so basically we're just looking for that oh okay so does that answer our question then yes it does i mean the alternative is we know that the kinetic energy of particles is equal to three halves kt so therefore we could have m k and t but that isn't an option here so it has to be this one up here so the answer has to be d again 10 an object of mass that lifted through a height that at a constant speed that what is the minimum power required to lift the object? Well, we know that work done, I'm just going to call it E is equal to FD. And so that's going to be MGD or, you know, MGH. It's the same thing, isn't it? Just uh, gravitational potential energy. But we know that power, if we divide by time, we end up with power. But then it's going to be not MGH, but MGH over time. And that is equal to MG times the speed. Therefore, it's just going to be all these things multiplied together. They've tried to throw a spanner in the works by putting the height in there, but that doesn't make a difference, does it? Because we've been given the speed. So it's going to be the same power throughout that journey. So that gives us 3.5 watts. So the answer is C. 11 Kepler 90. Okay, we have two planets. Okay, so we have 210 days and that distance. And then we have that distance. So we're looking for the time period of the other one. Yeah, okay. So Kepler's law we know is T squared is proportional to R cubed. Therefore, we can say that, well, if we're looking for uh, the time period for H, we're just gonna say TH squared over TG squared. So we're just gonna say TH squared over TG squared is equal to RH cubed over R g cubed and of course we can just uh, put that together can't we because we have both of their distances we don't need to convert into meters or anything like that because it's all proportional works with any unit so long as you're consistent and so we're going to take this the other side so tg squared and so it's going to be the square root of all this so we can either say we can either calculate this then square root it or we can just say get rid of the square there and then say that's to the power of three over two so that's a neat little shortcut there so our h is 1.01 divided by 0.71 that's to the power of three halves times that pi tg which is 210 and what do we end up with let's put it in our calculator it's basically earth isn't it so 356 days not quite though, is it? So the answer is C. 12 oscillations of an object can be either free or forced. Which of these is a forced oscillation? A ball rolling to and fro in a curved track? No, because it's just the restoring force that is, that is making it move. A loudspeaker oscillating and producing 
a continuous note. Yes, that sounds about right because we actually have energy going into the system, don't we? Because current's going into the coil, making the magnet move, etc., etc. Uh, mass oscillating on a spring, no pendulum bob, no. So the answer has to be B. 13, force against distance graph. What's the best estimate for the energy stored when the extension is 10 millimeters? Oh, seriously? Okay, right. Uh, what are they going to expect us to do? Count little squares? I blooming hope not. Okay, I tell you what. Let's just let's just say this first, so we know that we have the area under that is going to be well twenty newtons times turn it into meters, so zero point zero one, and then we divide that by two, don't we? So essentially, ten times zero point zero one, which gives us zero point one joules. So that zero point one joules underneath there. Ah, uh, oh, okay, there we go. Yeah, it's just an estimate, isn't it? We know it's not going to be less than that. We know it's not going to be that because it's more than that because we have this extra curvy bit there. We know it's not going to be double it, so the answer has to be C, doesn't it? 14, ball of mass is falling through the air. Force F is less than the weight of the object. Acceleration free follows that. Which expression is correct for the acceleration A of the ball? So let's crack out Newton's second law. We know F is equal to MA but it's a simple equation, but we need to be clear on what we're actually looking at here. F is the resultant force, isn't it? So therefore, we're going to say that the resultant force is weight minus the air resistance, or the F, so there we go, we're going to call it that, equals MA. So therefore, well, weight is MG, isn't it? So minus F equals MA. So I'll do it again down here, that is that, and so, Therefore, we're looking for accelerations. So therefore, just take M over the other side. And so that's going to be equal to, well, G, because the M's cancel for that. Uh, but it's still going to be underneath the M there. So that's, oh, OK. They actually haven't gone that far. Cheeky beggars. So that's our answer, is it? Yeah. It's just going to be B. They really should tidy that up, though. Disgraceful. 15, parallax angle is that many seconds. What is the distance in parsecs? Well, our equation is parallax is equal to one over the distance. Therefore, distance is one over the angle. So therefore, that's gonna be equal to one over 0 0.015. And that gives us 67 parsecs. So the answer is A. Okay, moving on to normal questions. No more fun. 16, we want to determine value of acceleration for G. We want to determine G. So we have an electromagnet classic setup here. Student uses S equals half GT. Good, there we go. Show that the equation S equals half GT squared is homogeneous with both sides of the equations having the same base units. So we know that that's equal to m so that's a, a way you can put it square brackets means the dimensions or the units of that is that and we can say that the units of gt squared is equal to meters per second squared because of course it is acceleration times by second squared so therefore they are equal easy describe how the student could use standard laboratory equipment to take accurate measurements of the distance s and time t well s would have to be a ruler wouldn't it use ruler to find s but when it comes to measuring uh, something that's stuck to something else that kind of thing maybe you can't get the ruler close enough we're going to say that we're going to use a set square to do that and of course it's going to have to be to the bottom of the ball as well because of course that's what is going to be hitting the trapdoor. Uh, of course, that's to the trapdoor, isn't it? Oh, by the way, we use a set square to avoid parallax error. Let's put that in there, why not? Timer to measure T. Oh yeah, it's hooked up to a timer. Yeah, what am I chatting about? So the wires, wires, or we can say output from both sets of wires used. Uh, I guess we could do repeats four marks so it makes sense carry out repeat readings and calculate mean there we go four points there methinks okay we have a force time graph 
as per usual we know we're going to have to find out the area under the graph so let's do that before we even look at the question and we know that the area under the graph is equal to the impulse and so that's going to be 30 times by 20 times 10 to the minus 3 and then of course that's divide by 2 isn't it so actually we can just say that that is 30 times 10 to the power of minus 3 or in other words times 10 to the minus 2 so in other words that is 0 0.3 newton seconds or kilogram meters per second same thing okay calculate the initial momentum just before it hits the trapdoor okay just before it hits the trapdoor i mean th this is after it's hit the trapdoor okay so we have the speed at which it hits the door with so therefore oh it's just one mark isn't it we know that momentum is equal to mv so that's going to be equal to 0 0.05 times by 4.4 so i do believe that's going to give us 0 0.2 0 0.22 kilogram meters per second cool use a graph to calculate the magnitude of the final momentum of the ball immediately after the collision well we've just done that we said that that was 0 0.3 so let's have a think about this so it was going downwards with 0 0.22 newton seconds of momentum but then we have this amount of impulse being imparted to it of course it's imparting that momentum in the opposite direction isn't it so therefore if it was going down with 0 0.22 but it's been given 0 0.3 in the opposite direction we could say minus 0 0.3 that means that 0 0.2 so we're looking for the change in momentum aren't we 0 0.22 minus 0 0.3 and so that gives us ultimately minus 0 0.08 kilogram meters per second. We're just looking for the magnitude though, so we can just put 0 0.08. Not the easiest question in the world. It's very easy to get caught out with that. I have to be honest, I got caught out with that. I'm doing this very quickly. You've got to make sure that you read the questions more carefully than I am. Read them three times. Make sure that you're getting the right end of the stick. Mass of the trapdoor is 100 grams. Calculate the final speed of the trapdoor immediately after the collision okay so if we know that it's given this much momentum to the ball then it has to have gained that much momentum as well so p is equal to mv therefore v is equal to p over m so there's going to be the 0 0.3 that it's gained it gave that much to the ball but it's gained just as much conservation of momentum divided by well 100 grams that's just 0 0.1 so therefore it's just going to be three meters per second 17 metal strip we have five measurements determine the percentage uncertainty in the thickness t okay so we know that first of all the uncertainty in a mean is equal to half the range so there's going to be half times what have we got here that's the biggest that's the smallest so I can see the range is going to be 0 0.04 millimeters. So that's going to be 0 0.02 millimeters. Okay, let's find a mean now. So I'm just going to be adding them all up and then dividing by 5. That gives me 1.872, but it has to be to the same degree of accuracy. So it's just 1.87 and so therefore now we want to find the percentage uncertainty so that's going to be 0 0.02 divided by 1.87 times by 100 so in other words it's going to be 2 divided by 1.87 so it's going to be just over 1 i'm just going to call that 1 percent there we go b student wants to determine young modulus of the metal strip here so we have it bending like that the young modulus can be determined by this. Oh my days, what a crazy equation. So M, yes, L, W, T is the period of the oscillations. Okay, that's pretty cool, that's pretty cool. Describe how an, an experiment may be safely conducted and how the data can be analyzed to determine an accurate value for E. Okay, so what do we have to obtain? We have to obtain M, L, W, T, and t squared now what's staying constant well l and t and w are staying constant so really what we want to do is change m and observe t so m is going to be our independent variable isn't it so i'm going to write down the equation again here 16 pi squared m l cubed over w t squared t whoopsie t cubed there 
Okay, so let's have a look then. So we want to have uh, m is independent variable, t is dependent. So first of all, how do we find the length? Find length using meter rule, w and t using a vernier caliper. Measure at multiple points and calculate average. I mean, we've already seen that in the previous question for thickness, haven't we? Let's say mean. Okay, so we dealt with the constants. Now we need to say uh, we're going to use fiducial marker at equilibrium of system to avoid parallax error when timing. We want to displace and let oscillate. Use timer to obtain time for, let's say, 20 oscillations and calculate mean. Change mass and repeat. So our equation is all of that there. So in case we have m and t squared, don't we? Uh, so therefore we can say that, well, if we have a graph of m against t squared, we will end up or should end up with a straight line. So that's gonna be our gradient there. Plot graph of m versus t squared. Gradient is equal to, well, it's going to be just putting everything over the other side there. It's gonna be equal to e times mt cubed over 16 pi squared l cubed. And then we can just say, use this to calculate E. Oh, I haven't talked about M, have I? Uh, use balance to find M. There we go. Oh, hang on a minute. Are they changing the, uh, are they changing the length? I don't think it says, does it? Oh, uh, it's fixed. Is it fixed? Mm, I think that's a little bit mean that they haven't, uh, they should have said that you're changing, um, they're changing L. Okay, uh, change L. Uh, in that case, well, here's our equation. In that case, our gradient is going to be that instead, isn't it? So then the gradient would be, well, our graph would be L cubed against T squared. Yeah, so in that case, uh, the gradient would be equal to uh, just everything else. So 16, so E times time E W T cubed over 16 pi squared M instead. How to do it safely? Mm, I don't know. Ensure ruler is clamped securely to bench. Wear goggles? I don't know. Whatever, moving on. 16, 150 watt heater, so that's power. Use the heat, 25 grams of ice. The initial temperature of the ice is minus 20 degrees. Use a graph to determine the specific heat capacity of ice. So we're going to be using this bit here, aren't we? Okay, so we need to find out, well, here's our equation, mc delta t or delta theta, whatever. We're looking for c, therefore, well, hang on a minute. Let's, you know, let's just think that we don't have energy. We have power, don't we? So I'm going to replace that with power times time. Therefore, c is equal to power times the time divided by the mass times the change in temperature. So that is 150 times by, how long does it take? Seven seconds, because that heated up fast, divided by the mass in kilograms, which is 0 0.025 times the change in temperature, which is 20. Uh, let's replace this with 0 0.5. So divided by 0 0.5, in other words, times by two. So 300 times seven, I think I can do that in my head. That's 2,100. Didn't even need a calculator, go me. And uh, yeah, it has given it in kilograms. So therefore we know we need to uh, have that mass in kilograms. Use the graph to determine the specific latent heat of fusion of ice. So it goes from seven all the way to 63. So therefore it took 56 seconds. And uh, we know that for latent heat, it's just ML. Again, it's power times time equals ML. So therefore taking M over the other side, it's that. And so that's equal to 150 times 56 divided by again, 0 0.025. Uh, that's basically times by 40, isn't it? So therefore uh, I'm gonna say that that is, uh, that would be 600. So the 6,000 times by 56. Could do that in my head. I can't be bothered. 
and that ends up being 336,000, which sounds about right. Should we go to two sig figs? Mm, maybe. Use a graph to compare the specific heat capacities of ice and water. Uh, okay, so the specific heat capacity for this water bit here, which is going to be the same equation, but it takes a little bit longer. It takes 14 seconds instead of seven seconds. Oh, so therefore we can say that uh, it takes twice as long to change by same temp. Therefore, SHC is two times 2,100, so 4,200. And we should recognize that number for the SHC of liquid water. Well, there we go. Uh, cool, describe the motions of the molecules in region X and Z. So basically in solid and liquid form, X particles, molecules rather, they vibrate and we say around or about, let's say that instead, about fixed positions. That's the best way of putting it. And then for liquid water, molecules are able to move. Cool. Next, the internal energy of the ice increases. Complete the table. Okay, fine. Region X. So we know that here with X, the temperature is increasing. We know anything to do with temperature is to do with Ke. Here, the temperature is not increasing, so the only thing that could possibly be increasing is potential energy. And then here is kinetic energy. So this is like a year nine question, to be perfectly honest. So um, we're just being asked to put what's actually changing in all of these. It's not going to be both at any time. It's just going to be one of them. Uh, so in region X, we said it was going to be kinetic energy. Uh, what remains the same? Potential energy. Why? It's the other way around. And then there we go. That's it. What an easy question. State the temperature of the ice at which its molecules have zero kinetic energy. It's minus 273 degrees Celsius or zero Kelvin. 19 wheelie bin. This is moments. Okay, so we have the pivot there. Just going to draw this line of action there or the line going 90 degrees to the line of action, whatever. Okay, laws of information. So state the principle of moments, fine, uh, for an object to be in equilibrium. Sum of clockwise moments equals sum of anti-clockwise moments. Easy. So the magnitude of the minimum force F, which lifts the front end of the wheelie bin off the ground is 96 newtons. Okay, so we know that we have F there, but we're concerned with the force uh, the components of that force that is uh, at 90 degrees to that line to the pivot so therefore this is going to be f cos 20. so we know that this is pulling clockwise but then the weight of it is pulling anti-clockwise uh, so therefore we can say that the moment due to the weight is going to be 0.3 w just distance times the force and then that has to equal well this distance here which is 1.3 times f cos 20 there we go so let's write this down again here 0.3 w oh well we we know what it is don't we so 0.3 mg so 0.3 mg yeah let's write that down is equal to 1.3 f cos 20 so therefore we're looking for f so let's pop everything else over the other side so 0.3 i'm going to put my weight in there now so there's 40 kilograms times 9.8 and divide that by, well, our 1.3 cos 20. And sure enough, that gives us 96.3 newtons, but two sig figs, 96 newtons. So yeah, whenever it comes to moments at a funky angle, we just want to resolve it to find the component that is perpendicular to the distance to the pivot. Use your answer to that to calculate the magnitude of the force R required to stop the wheelie bin from moving to the right. Okay, well, this isn't moments. This is literally just forces. There's no horizontal component to the weight. So we know that we have R going that way. We have F cos 20 going that way. Even though they're nowhere near each other, uh, they're still going in opposite directions. That's all we care about. So therefore, F cos 20. So that's equal to 96 cos 20. I mean, we could have just done, to be honest, that, but whatever. Let's just do it again. And it gives us 90.2, so 90 newtons.
So you've got 91, that's just rounding error. The wheelie bin is now placed on an adjustable slope. The wheels are now fixed, so they cannot move. Angle theta made by the slope is steadily increased from zero. Explain with that calculation at what angle theta the wheelie bin starts to topple clockwise. Well, we know it's when the center of mass, the line of action for the weight, crosses over that pivot. But then it says at what angle, so that's really, really mean. So we'd have to do a calculation, but actually that's what they're just looking for. When line of action of weight is to the right of the pivot, the wheel. 20 diagram shows earth in space, space. We're gonna to have to draw something, aren't we? Look at all that lovely empty space. On the diagram above, draw a minimum of four gravitational field lines to map out the gravitational field pattern around the earth. One, two, three, four, cool. Next, on say diagram show two different points where the gravitational potential is the same. Label these points X and Y. Potential, we could do it right on the surface, couldn't we? But there and there has to be the same distance away from the Earth. Weird. Satellite is in a circular geostation, blah, 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 blah. We have the mass, and we have the mass, and we have the radius. Cool, we actually have the radius, good. Describe some features of a geostationary orbit. Calculate the total energy of the satellite in its geostationary orbit. Well, we know that, let's do the energy bit first, shall we? E total. Oh, actually, I don't know. Yeah, why not? So that's equal to GPE plus KE. Now GPE is easy to do because that's just gonna be G M M over R. But then this is gonna be a little bit tricky because how do we find the speed? Well, we're going to find the speed. Well, there's a couple of ways we can do this, but we might as well just use omega R because if it's in a geostationary orbit, then by de facto, we know the time period says so 2 pi fr or 2 pi r over t. So that is equal to 2 pi times 4.22 times 10 to the 7 divided by, well, 24 hours times 3,600 to turn it into seconds. What does this end up being then? I get 3,068, 69, 3,070 meters per second. So therefore, Total energy is going to be 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 times the mass of the Earth, which is that. Because it's turning into a bit of a beastie calculation. I'm not going to be able to fit all this on, am I? Times the mass of the satellite divided by the radius. Can I cancel some powers of 10? I think so. This ends up being 17 minus 11 and plus 17. So that just ends up being plus six instead. And then we're gonna add on half times 2,500 times my beastie speed squared. Do not mess this up putting this inside shorts. So I get for the potential energy, I get 2.36 times 10 to the 10 joules plus 0 0.5 times another 1.18 times 10 to the 10. So by my calculation, that should be 3.54 times 10 to the 10 joules. Please be right. Now, looking at the mark scheme, they've put the gravitational potential energy as minus. And so they've actually taken away the 2.36 from the 1.18. That's really bizarre. That makes no sense at all, does it? Because yes, we know that according to potentials being minus and everything like that, technically it's minus, but you can't just add on a minus GPE to your kinetic energy and say that's total. That implies that as it falls, it's actually going to have more energy. That is ridiculous. OCR have massively, they've massively bought there. What have they been smoking over there? That is ridiculous. That is gonna be correct. That makes no sense at all. Yeah, weird. Rare OCRL. 
I guess we're all susceptible. We're all capable of doing that. Okay, geostationary orbit, what can we say about it? Well, time period equals 24 hours. Uh, it stays above equator, uh, above fixed point equator. There we go, that's what we can say. You silly billies, OCR. Okay, 21, we have a spring and a car. Cars push against it, blah, blah, blah. I'm a poet and I didn't realize we have the acceleration, we have the mass, and we have the K. Cool. Calculate the time it takes for the spring to return to its original length after the car is released. Well, well, well. So, oh, oh. It moves in simple harmonic motion. That's where they're trying to get us. Right. Oh, it's fixed to it. Okay, 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 fine. So, we're going to have to use our equation, aren't we? For spring, T is equal to 2 pi root M over K. So the time period is therefore equal to 2 pi times the root of 0 0.08 kilograms divided by 60. And that gives us 0 0.2 Let's go with two, three seconds. Now, it's not doing a whole SHM cycle, though it's not doing a whole oscillation, it's only doing a quarter of that. So therefore we need to divide by that. It's quarter T is equal to 0 0.23 divided by four. And so that gives us 0 0.057 seconds. Cool. It's only going to equilibrium, isn't it? It's not going even all the way over here. What a weird question. The arrangement is used to propel the toy car along a smooth track. Point A is the top of the track. Launch speed of the car is now adjusted so it reaches A with zero speed. Oh no. Oh, okay. The height is that. All the elastic potential energy of the spring is transferred to gravitational potential energy of the car. Calculate the initial compression X of the spring. Okay, so basically we're just saying that uh, GPE equals PE of the spring. So therefore, mgh is equal to half kx squared because, well, we don't have the force, do we? We can calculate it, but we have k, so why not? Let's use that. Therefore, x is equal to, it's going to be 2mgh over k, all square rooted. So that's a square root of 2 times 0 0.08 times 9.8 times 0 0.2 divided by 60. And we end up with 7.2 times 7, I'm just gonna say 0 0.07, let's get a two sig fig, 0 0.072. At a specific speed, the car leaves point A horizontally and lands. This is gonna be SUVAT, he thinks. Explain how the time of flight between A and B depends on the speed of the car at A. Well, that's because faster horizontal speed at A means further distance traveled in time taken to reach the track, which is always the same due to acceleration of gravity being always the same. Okay, we've mentioned the whole fact that it spends the same amount of time in the air both, in both times. Explain how the distance D depends on the scar. Oh, flip. Oh, I've messed this up, haven't I? Okay, uh, I did distance there. I'm gonna have to put that over there. What an idiot. So how does the time of flight depend on the speed of the car at A? As acceleration due to gravity is constant and initial vertical velocity equals zero. There we go. We could say they're independent, can we? Okay, what a weird little question. 22 particle accelerator uses a ring of electromagnets to keep protons moving continuously in a cycle. Speed V. Uh, protons, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so we have a nice straight line, don't we? We're gonna have to, whoops, you get the idea. So the grain of the graph of V against F is equal to two pi R, where R is the radius of the circular path of the protons. Well, it's because we know V is equal to two pi F. I mean, we can say that, can't we? V is equal to omega R. We could go with like MV squared. Ugh. Yeah, I don't think we need to do that, no. Nope. Nope, nope, that's fine. So therefore, V is equal to two, it's only two marks, so that makes sense. Equals two pi FR, therefore, 
v over f is equal to 2 pi r. Easiest question ever. Next, show that r is about 10 meters by determining the gradient of the line of best fit through the data points. So you should be looking at a gradient of about 62.5 apparently. I'm not gonna find that. And so therefore that's equal to 2 pi r. So therefore putting those over the other side. So let's find out what 62, I mean two times pi, that sounds about right, doesn't it? 9.9 .9 meters. Maximum speed of the protons is that. And uh, calculate the maximum centripetal force acting on the proton at this speed. F is equal to mv squared over r. So therefore this is equal to 1.7 times 10 to the minus 27 times by two times 10 to the seven squared. So in other words, that's four times 10 to the 14. Let's just go with that. Can cancel some powers of 10 in a second, divided by, let's just say 10. And so therefore, well, divide by 10, that's just gonna be then 13, minus 27 plus 13, so it's gonna be minus 14 there. So 1.7 times by four, uh, that is going to be 3.4, 6.8. So 6.8 times 10 to the minus 14. Didn't even need a calculator. New particle accelerator is now built, so the protons move in a radius of that instead. Ring of electromagnets for this new particle accelerator provides the same maximum centripetal force as the accelerator in A. Calculate the maximum speed of the protons, so this sounds like a proportionality question. So what did we say? Uh, F is equal to mv squared over r, uh, but if they have the same force, then that means, and the same mass as well, then that means that we're saying that v squared is proportional to r, so therefore v is proportional to root r. And what's happened to the radius? Well, it's doubled, hasn't it? So therefore this whole thing goes up by root two, so therefore maximum centripetal force. So that means that the new speed is going to be, oh, how fast are they going? Two times 10 to the seven times by root two, Oh, so in other words, two to the power of th three halves, and that gives us 2.8 times 10 to the seven meters per second. 23, Algol is a triple star system with stars AA1, AA2. They're very imaginative coming up with these star names. So here's some data. Calculate the gravitational field strength G at the surface of AA1 to three sig fix. Include the absolute uncertainty in your answer. Okay, Ugh, here we go. So AA1, we're talking G is equal to G M over R squared. So equal to 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 times the mass, which is 6.31 times 10 to the 30 divided by the radius squared, so 1.9 times 10 to the nine or squared. And so, uh, I don't think I'm going to tidy up powers of 10 here. I can't really be bothered. So I end up with 116, no, 117. So it ends up being 116.586. So that has to be then 117. So 117 is our answer. Now we need to come up with an uncertainty. So we are gonna to have to use percentage uncertainties. So uh, percentage uncertainty in M, let's give it that first, is equal to 0.42 divided by 6.31. And then we can times by 100, etc. Yeah, let's do that, why not? You, you can take a shortcut, you might see the shortcut. So that's essentially 42 divided by 6.31. That gives us 6.7%. And then percentage uncertainty in R is equal to 0 0.14 divided by 1.9 times 100. So that is 14 divided by 1.9. So that gives us 7.4%. So therefore, well, we need to times it by two because of course it's R squared. So times by two is equal to 14.8%. And then we add on the 6.7% and we end up with 21.5%. Okay, so then let's do 117 times by 0 0.215, and that gives us 
uh, 0.2, but of course it needs to be the same degree of accuracy as our value. So that's just going to be plus or minus 25 newtons per kilogram. Five, we have luminosities and surface temperatures of the three stars. To find the luminosity of a star, it is the total power output of a star. We could say total radiant power outputs of a star, but that's fine. Use Stefan's law to determine the ratio, radius of AA2 to radius of AA1. So let us get Stefan's law out. So power or luminosity is equal to Stefan's constant area t to the power of four. We're dealing with radius, not area. So therefore we need to replace that with, well, let's, first of all, that's a constant, isn't it? So therefore we can say, well, let's go with luminosity, actually. Luminosity is proportional to a t to the power of four. And we know that area is equal to, for a sphere, four pi r squared. So therefore, let's make it a capital R actually. Therefore, L is proportional to, forgetting about the four and the pi, proportional to r squared t to the four. Let's pop this up here. Therefore, radius squared is proportional to L over t to the four. Cool, so therefore, we can say that the radius of two squared over the radius of a, a three squared is equal to L two over T two to the power of four divided by L three divided by T three to the power of four. There we go. Let's tidy this up a little bit then, shall we? This ends up on top. So there's going to be equal to T three to the power of four times L two divided by T2 to the power of four times by L3. Okay, so I'm gonna put some numbers in then. So T3 to the four is going to be 7,500 to the power of four times by L2, which is 6.92, divided by 4,500 to the power of four times by 10. So I'll tell you what, I can just turn this into times by 0 0.692. Uh, and then, of course, I'm going to have to square root that at the end, aren't I? Because I still have the square there. But let's find this out first. So the power of 4 divided by... Well, actually, I can factorise that, can't I, of course? So I end up with 5.34 for that square root of the answer, and I end up with 2.3. So I'm just going to say square root all of that, and we end up with 2.3. I hate those kind of questions. It's really easy to make a mistake with those. Part 3, use Vian's law to explain which star would have the longest wavelength. Uh, so we want this to be the biggest. So let's get Wien's law out. Uh, that is peak wavelength is inversely proportional to the temperature. Uh, so therefore, if we want the longest wavelength, we want the lowest temperature. And that is A82. Easy. Suggest so how an astronomer using an optical telescope can deduce that the three stars of Algol have different surface temperatures. They'll be different colors. Easy. The light from each star passing through diffraction grating shows the absorption line spectrum. Explain how a specific absorption line is produced in this type of spectrum in terms of photons and electrons. Ugh, okay, fine. Um, so what we say is that light from continuous spectrum, so basically all wavelengths, passes through gas in star, photons absorbed by electrons and they are excited to a higher energy level. Energy of the photon is equal to change in energy level for electron. Uh, there we go. That's, that's three points there. That's fine. The AA1 star could evolve into a black hole state. Two ways in which the black hole would differ from the A1 star. While it would be smaller, smaller size, uh, we could say that it also has a much higher density. That's basically it, isn't it? The mark scheme says you could talk about like it absorbs light and stuff like that, but it's not really about the star itself. Well, I guess it is, but you know, the stuff that we've written there, all the other stuff to do with the black hole comes from that, doesn't it? So there we go. Hope you found it helpful. If you did, please leave a like. If you really found it helpful, consider hitting that super thanks button. Really goes a long way to helping me keep making these possible videos to help you guys. And click on the card if you want to go to the playlist to see all of the other OCR papers, and I'll see you next time.